Tejasvina vadita mastu ma vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So good morning, good morning, good morning, dears and namaste. Uh, as most of you know, we are studying Swami Prabhavananda's book, uh, his collection of talks published as uh, Realizing God. Uh, Swami Prabhavananda was the head of the Vedanta Society of Southern California from 1930 until he deliberately left the body on July 4th, 1976. Uh, these, this collection of talks was uh, put together by his disciple Edith Tipple, and we are studying his talk, Silence. Uh, I have the blessed privilege this morning of having in the room with me Anshu Patre and three of his friends. Uh, so you may hear some voices uh, during the discussion, uh, either offering some contribution from their own wisdom or asking a, asking a question or raising a concern. So before we begin, uh, is there anything that anyone would like to offer or ask uh, that is uh, left over, so to speak, from the last time we met? Anything at all? All right, dears. We'll start with the reading of Swami Prabhavananda's silence. We're not very far into it. You are never separate, never apart from God, not for a moment. But the consciousness is reflecting on the mind, which rises. But the, but the consciousness is reflecting on the mind, which rises in waves of craving and desiring all the time, so that the reflection is not complete or perfect. Now, how to gain control over the mind, how to achieve silence? It is not something passive. When you go to sleep, your mind is blank, unconscious, but the mind freed from the contents of consciousness is very different. By that, the Swami means this, the mind immersed in silence. So I'll read that again. When you go to sleep, your mind is blank, unconscious, but the mind freed from the contents of consciousness is very different. <clears throat> when you free yourself from the contents of consciousness, there is full consciousness. It is not unconscious. It is, it is full consciousness. In the same way, the waking state is also partial consciousness. It is not full consciousness. So the way is not to make the mind blank but to raise one huge wave to the exclusion of the rest. 
So I'm going to read that again. It is such an important, this is the purpose of contemplation, concentration, and meditation, which is a, is a process. So the way is not to make the mind blank, but to raise one huge wave to the exclusion of the rest. And that huge wave must be the thought of God, must be the thought of God, because that's what will happen in the mind when everything else is silent. No matter how you conceive of him, whatever you consider God to be, that will ultimately lead you to the reality. And that's why you've heard it stressed that each of us is unique. That's why the Swami says, no matter how you conceive of him, whatever you consider God to be, that will ultimately lead you to the reality. Now, again, the reality is not one thing. It's infinite. It contains, as St. As Thomas Aquinas said, draw a circle around all you know of the universe, and God can barely fit a toe there. So when we are released from the constraints, which is what we so desperately want to be, that is our, that is the underlying, this is why we get so confused about what freedom is. And we, we try different kinds of things thinking, well, this is freedom, that's freedom. No, freedom is being without desire, without cravings, and ultimately without thought waves in the mind. Now, before we go on, are there any, is there anything you'd like to offer from your own experience, your own wisdom, or any concern or question you'd like to raise about what's been said? I'm going to jump in and say, I just think this is, this lesson message is so important um, about, because it really is God or the divine as you apprehend it. And you know, human beings, just because it's what our minds do, um, we like to put everything in a box. It makes us more comfortable. We put it in a box and we give it a name and we decorate the outside of it, <laughs> but, you know, to suit ourselves, um, which is, you know, is, is fine and has a place and a time. But I just think ultimately moving beyond that, because the divine is beyond that. Yeah. It is so beyond that. And, you know, yes, God once right. told me, let me out of the box. Let me out of the box. <laughs> Kidding, because the divine is not in a box. We put the divine yes. in a box. The, the reality, capital R, is beyond all definition. Right. Thank you, Cindy, for that. So, thank you for this. Any anything else from anyone about uh, this idea that uh, silencing the the whole body mind complex, which is the reason for contemplation, concentration, and meditation, and what it leads to is discovery, uncovering of the reality which is that our true original nature, which exists within us already. Brother Shankar, this is Haima. Yes, Haima. Namaste. And Namaste. I, just want, I just wanted to add something to Cindy's. Uh, it's the, the detachment, which is karma yoga teaches us. And that detachment and going into silence really help achieve this, what you are talking about. I think that leads us to the right path. Yes, desireless, desireless state. 
and continue to do what you have to do, but don't expect anything in return. The return is left to God, the divine, divine. That's yes, what really- Accept everything that happens. Accept everything that happens as the will and, and gift of God, the prasad. Accepting pain and pleasure equally without having extreme emotional state. Ah, uh, yes, but that's a very high state, Haima. You're right, of course. But that this this ability to accept tough pain one. And pleasure equally. That's very, very tough one. Yes. Time. That's very close to the very end when you really are in that state. It but is. of course it is the idea. Thank you, Brother Shekra. Thank you, dears. But Both um, you. it is, yeah, that is the highest state to not be affected at all to be but what was that who was it talked about the 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 doll what was that thing that was the weighted doll that you you punch oh, and that, it would go that, all the way that, over that's me <laughs> well that's you well i love yeah. that because that's kind of where we what we're doing and what we can do because i think what gets to be a real problem for humans is something happens you have a human emotional response but then you hang on to it yes and well what what cindy's talking about is the metaphor for us as human beings uh, we all have seen i'm sure these weighted dolls clown dolls santa claus dolls they have a weight in the bottom and they're plastic and they blow up and you can knock them sideways and what they do is they go whoa 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 they come back to center. Yeah. Well, the, the, when we practice spiritual disciplines, we become like that clown doll and we more quickly come back to center because the weight at the bottom is our spiritual practice. But thanks for remembering that. Yes, indeed, it is a powerful metaphor for <clears throat> what we become. <clears throat> um, as we practice. All right. And uh, Brother Shankara, uh, yeah, that reminded me what Holy Mother said exactly, that uh, you do experience the pain and uh, agony and all that misery and suffering in life, but it does not affect you as, as deeply and it's just like a pinprick. It, 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 it is, it is, it, uh, yes. Uh, ultimately, this is the case, yes. But uh, you know, if you if you look at Holy Mother's life, you see that she actually did physically suffer for many, many, uh, many, many ailments and many over many years. Thank you, Nira, for bringing that up. But yes, ultimately, that is what happens. So back to the text. Nobody can really define God. But each one of us can have a can have our uh, ah can have thank you nobody can really define God but each one of us can have a conception of God a conception is the meaning is the reading is the reading with our human minds of the great truth the illustration can be the illustration can be given of the ocean way with containers of different shapes and sizes you go and dip your vessel into the ocean and what have you got water but it has taken the shape of your vessel so think of god in any way that appeals to you so think of god in any way that appeals to you Eventually, the vessel will break and the water will return to the ocean. That is the experience of reality. So in the beginning, of course, we have our conception of God. We have our conception of ourselves. We have our conception of universe. All of that is fundamentally illusory. That is, it comes and it goes as a wave in the ocean rises and falls 
The ocean doesn't change. It simply takes name and form as a way. So as we go forward, slowly and slowly, we understand that none of this is other than our experience of reality as this impermanent state. And that the permanent state is behind and that is the truth of our being and where true freedom and happiness lies. All eventually, there's sirens going by. Eventually, the vessel will break and the water will return to the ocean. That is the experience of reality. And by the way, thank you, Anshu, for uh, noting what the word was. Anytime I stumble and you see what it is, don't hesitate to help me that way. Sure. That's excellent. The moment you try to think of God, to raise that one wave to the exclusion of all others, and I'm going to start that again, because this is the key. The moment you try to think of God, to raise that one wave to the exclusion of others, all the other cravings and desires and thoughts and distractions pour in. And it's perfectly natural. It is the very energy of universe reflecting in your mind stuff, which is throughout your body, not just in your, in your head. So all that pours in. You were feel you feel <laughs> this is the Swami's sense of humor. You feel you were better off before you began. That's what happens. And that is why Arjuna said in the Gita, I think the wind is no wilder, speaking of the mind. I think the wind is no wilder. To which Sri Krishna responded, Yes, Arjuna, the mind is restless, no doubt, and hard to subdue but it can be brought under control by constant practice and the exercise of dispassion. So to what, what is the prescription? Constant practice. We can't do it this week and say, well, you know, I'm busy next week. No, we have to do it every day and every day and every day. You've heard me say this many times. If you want to become a star tennis player, two things, three things. First, you must really want that to the exclusion of everything else. Then you must find a competent teacher who can help you gain the mastery. Then you must do what you are told and you can't practice today and not practice tomorrow and expect to gain that ability to serve the ball and hit it into that four, uh, that, that 16 square inch, four by four by uh, place to hit an ace. You're just not gonna be able to do it. So you have to practice and practice and practice. And what is this dispassion? This dispassion is what I mentioned as to the exclusion of everything else. The ache has to become so great that you say, I want this and nothing else. And so you begin to say, it isn't that the things that arise in your life are bad and wrong. You simply say no to them. Your duties, of course, you must go ahead, but you can deal with those also dispassionately. That is to say, I'm doing this, I must work, I must do these things. Of course, love and, and the relationship with other human beings, that has a special category. But, uh, and ultimately, uh, even that at the, at the hour of death, of course, even that will be left behind. So you must be capable of the dispassion of not 
holding on to that at the hour of death. But this is what's meant by constant practice and the exercise of dispassion. So any uh, comments or questions, anything from your own experience you'd like to offer or anything that you'd like to ask or raise as a concern? Can I, can I talk? Please, of course. Um, I'll talk a little louder. Um, I was thinking two things when I when you when you were speaking, and it's this concept of the first of the three uh, things that you need to to realize God, and and that's wanting it more than anything else. And the question that I have is, I don't want it more than anything else. You know, I want I have all these desires. Um, but it's, it's there, the desire is there, you know, the spiritual urge is there, but the, you know, I don't have that first precondition for the later things. And that messes up my practice that messes up, you know, everything else. Okay. The, and, the answer on shoot is pray for it. The, the answer to the prayer comes from within. The divine presence is within you and all of the great teachers, all of them, without exception, whether it's Buddha, be a lamp unto yourself or Jesus, ask and ye shall receive. Mm -hmm. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all else shall be added unto you. Mm -hmm. Sri Ramakrishna, pray with a yearning heart to God. Just say, I'm, I'm not there yet. I have this urge, I want it to increase. I want, this is what I want, but I, at this point I can't honestly say, I want it to the exclusion of everything else. Mm -hmm. Of course not. Mm -hmm. We don't start from there. Mm -hmm. We start from where we are. Mm -hmm. And then, we, and the power of prayer, this is where, where we started today. You are never separate. You are never apart from God, never for one moment. So what is, what is, as it says in Chaitanya's prayer, in the concept or name of God, the power resides. And so ask, and it is resident within you and slowly and slowly, slowly and slowly the ache will increase the desire for that and nothing else will increase and it is not a matter of weeks it is not a matter of months it is a matter of years you do not become a tennis star or a chess master it takes you years you know, it doesn't happen overnight. This is exactly the same. As Vivekananda said, education is nothing more than the training of the nerves. Now, he didn't mean the nerves in the brain. He meant throughout the whole body. You transform yourself physically. Your whole body transforms. Just as if you set out to be a tennis champion your body by the time you become a tennis champion would be very different than the body you started with and your mind would be different all you know the mind is throughout the body good morning brother uh, good morning this yes is, fred this is steven oh it's steven steven poitier hello yes, steven yes, so good to hear from you. yes. and um, i i um, wanted to uh, i mean i i really appreciate those comments. I don't know who made them right before you spoke, but I'm you sure. know, this I'm is sure. something, but you I'm know, sure. I think about really what I'm wanting. I want so, you know, so, or I, I'm so concerned about sometimes is my health, my financial security, my, you know, having companionship. And it made me, you know, also think, I, and, and I don't, I don't, I may be misquoting this, but I think that Jesus said something like, uh, uh, the person who's going to try to save their life is actually the one who's going to lose it. Precisely. Those who would save their life shall lose it. 
those who come unto me shall save their lives. And what else did he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added unto you. All wisdom, all security, all righteousness. You will understand the comments about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and how you do not need to worry about yourself. But it, when we do, when we do need to worry about ourselves, we must not fret about it. We must not get impatient with ourselves. We just have to say, well, this is how it is now. But I will pray that I become wiser, that I become more compassionate with myself. And so uh, slowly and slowly, one transforms. Thank you, Stephen. And Thank I'm sorry you. I didn't recognize your voice at first. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankara, this is Haima again. Yes, Haima. In, in response to Anshu and other gentlemen. And uh, yes, it takes a long time. It's like a baby steps. When the baby is trying to walk, how many times the baby falls down before their first walking, Brother Shankara? Yes that, is, yes, that that is how I felt in the beginning years ago when I started meditation. It was like you fall down and your mind wavers and you think it's a waste of time in years ago. And then uh, then you realize suddenly it happens. If you continue, have the perseverance, then God's footprints will follow you. He will carry you and he will be with you when you are doing well. When you are not well, he carries us. That's what my belief is. The footprints. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank happens. you. Yes, it exactly. Happens. That's exactly it. Thank you, Brother Shankar. So, anyone else? Okay. What? Yes. I did want to say just one thing about what we're saying right now that um, I think it's really important to be honest with ourselves. Oh, yes. About what we want, because those of us who are older and have been doing this for a while, or even maybe come to it later, we're in a very different place from younger people. I mean, I, yes. I've been doing some sort of spiritual stuff since high school, but I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, and certainly not for the same reasons. I initially got into meditation and into hatha yoga because I wanted to feel more at ease in the world and mm -hmm. I didn't you know I had anxiety and I had all this and I wanted more peace but it wasn't at that time to be one with God or to all of that um and there were definitely things that I wanted to find and I thought where I was going to find them was in relationships. And, you know, it wasn't until much, 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 much later in my life that I really realized that what I was trying to find in relationships was not in relationships. And that's why they didn't work very well. Yes. Exactly. I was putting too much on them. Um, that what I really did want was this, you know, 24 seven, connection with the divine not to say that i want to be in, immersed and dissociated from the rest of the world i don't but but anyway just to say that i think sometimes we you know we find out when we're younger about certain spiritual paths and we're drawn to them because yes. that's where we're going but yes we and, do and need and, to be honest with ourselves all along the way why do you want to do this right now yes Precisely, dear, precisely. And, you know, as you said about relationships, our understanding of relationships matures as we do our spiritual work. In the beginning, we do not understand the difference between human love and divine love. Divine love is unconditional, eternal. Human love, generally speaking, 
It's not because the person is bad. It's just because they too are wherever they are on the, on the path and on the spectrum of, of spiritual development. They're not capable of what it is that we really want, which is that unconditional love, that, uh, that connection with something that does not change and is ever reassuring. Thanks, Cindy. So we gain control by constant practice and the exercise of dispassion. For that, we have to create a new character. We have to be transformed. You see, religion is transformation of life and character. Religion is transformation of life and character, not for the moment, but permanently. For that, we must try to have a conception of God and concentrate upon that with regularity. But not only that, we have to know, we have to keep recollectedness. So, we have to have a conception of God and concentrate upon that with regularity. But not only that, we have to keep recollectedness while we are walking, while we are sitting, running, cooking, while we are doing anything. And of course, this is what is described so beautifully in chapters four and five of the Gita by Sri Krishna, how to actually achieve this recollectedness, which he calls living life sacramentally. It's so beautifully described by Sri Krishna, how to actually do what the Swami just said is necessary for us to have this profound and continuous experience of the divine. This recollectedness does not come easy and uh, none of this comes easy. It's easy to talk about, it's not easy to do. So uh, the, the, the instructions are there in great and loving detail by Sri Krishna in chapters four and five of the Gita. <clears throat> so you need to keep that rec recollectedness while you are doing anything. You may say you are too busy with your work and distracting thoughts associated with your work, but just analyze yourself, but just analyze yourself. And you will find that you are not really concentrated fully on any kind of work. Your mind is on other things. Keep your mind busy with God and do those other things too. Keep your mind busy with God and do those other things too. As I said, Sri Krishna explains in great detail how to do this. My master, this is Swami Prabhupada speaking of Swami Brahmananda or Raja Maharaj. My master used to say, try to keep 20% of your mind on duties and business and work. You can do wonderfully well. Keep 80% of your mind on God. Now that sounds absolutely absurd as we sit here, doesn't it? That I can do everything, all of my work and my duties, it's only 20% of my mind. And I can, you know, that's, that's one fifth of my mind. My, my understanding that the mind is, is not just the, the, the your thoughts. It is the activities of your entire body-mind complex, which is made of your five organs of perception and your five organs of action. It just seems absurd that you can get everything done. And this is why I say, if you want to understand how it can actually be accomplished, and, and, and again, the accomplishment 
Sri Krishna describes it so beautifully, but the achievement of actually doing it, of course, will take years of practice. But it can be done. You can see it in the lives of some of the Swamis we encounter. So keep 20% of your mind on duties and business and work. You can do wonderfully well. Keep 80% of your mind on God. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, I just have a side comment. I don't know if it's relevant, but uh, it just came to my mind that when one is doing Hatha Yoga uh, and the true yoga practice is to do with your awareness of your mind. And you could be doing your mantra at the same time doing your Hatha Yoga, the physical postures. Yes. And, and that's a wonderful experience, you know. So your, yes. your mind is on, on your body, you know. Well, once you learn, once you assimilated those postures, those asanas, then indeed you can um, do those postures. You can go through your routine and at the same time and practice your mantra. That's not... Uh, that's not uh, off to the side, Nira. That's right on the money. Anything else? Uh, that's what um, they say. The true yoga is the union between the mind and the body. Body is not separate. Well, that's exactly the point. There is no separation. We make this... Uh, uh, we make these separations between the mind and the psychology and the psychic awareness and the, it's, it's all one unit, uh, all one expression of what we came into this world with. And uh, the distinctions are those boxes that Cindy was talking about earlier. It does hurt me a lot when I do my yoga practice, when I'm doing my Hatha yoga I'm always, uh, I try to do, you know, repeat my mantra in my mind while I'm doing the physical yoga. That helps well, me. Well, it, that will improve both. <laughs> that will improve both your Hatha yoga and your mantra yoga. And the Swami says to do this business. Shankara, sorry, I have yes, a question. So uh, I have no doubt about the benefits of doing Hatha Yoga, but for those of us who didn't have an opportunity to learn, would that become an obstacle in our um, progress in spiritual path? No, dear, uh, but uh, there's, no, there's no requirement of it. The Ramakrishna order swamis uh, don't make any re requirement whatsoever. Uh, about uh, about hatha yoga, you know, they kind of mildly discourage it um, because it uh, it keeps people get distracted, and uh, I've absolutely lost my place. Ah, here we go. Okay. So keep 80% of your mind on God. And then Swami Prabhupada remarks, this comes through practice. And uh, of, of course, there's just nothing else but practice if we want to achieve these states of being and awareness. When you reach that stage, your mind flows toward God without any break or distraction. You, bec you become completely absorbed. And through such absorption, revelation comes. You see it. You see, it all depends on where your consciousness is. Aim 
at the highest, then you achieve something. And, and this is why I say, pray, pray, pray to the divine presence, the divine power within you. Give me that highest. As St. Teresa of Avila said, she was once walking in the street feeling desperate. And she passed an old monk who was repeating over and over, addressing it to God. Tell me everything you know. Tell me everything. And she said, a great gift of transformation had been given to me. Aim at the highest. Then you achieve something. Tell me everything you know. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added unto you. All the great ones, by this he means the great teachers, this is the Swami again, all the great ones urge us to be up and doing, to struggle and realize that complete absorption in God. In God. I'll read that again since I botched it. All the great ones urge us to be up and doing, to struggle and realize that complete absorption in God. Now, the, he uses the word realize very advisedly here. It, it goes beyond thought. It goes beyond uh, when we sink into the silence. We begin to have realizations. They're not uh, the, this answer to this prayer. Tell me everything you know begins to be your reality. We have no idea how we know it. As Meister Eckhart says, God's language is silence. A great silence within calls to us. <clears throat> that is the common goal of all religions. If we have that one goal, then we shall find all religions are true and we shall come to the idea of harmony and universality. Why is this important? Why does the Swami mention this? Because so many of us think so highly of our opinions, of our who, what we do and how we practice and so on. And so we are judgmental about the other religions and uh, say, oh, well, they, they haven't got it right. And of course, many of the other religions actually teach that as a way of, of being. Well, it's, it's, it's misguided in the long run uh, because it separates and it gives a sense of separation. You know, people need what they need when they need it. So no sense arguing with them about it. But uh, if we have that one goal, then we shall find all religions are true and we shall come to the ideal of harmony and universality. So we won't feel any, we won't have any concern or issues with people, even if they try to convert us or, you know, we just say, oh, all that you tell me is wonderful. I'll, I'll take that in. What is God? And now, here, and now, when the Swami asks such a question, it is really useful to pay very close attention to what he, his answer, because it's, it's very comprehensive. What is God? Everything that we see and perceive and experience today and tomorrow is, is not. Hmm? Everything that we see and perceive and experience today is, and um, I'm sorry, I, I botched that, I'm going to read it again. 
What is God? Everything that we see, sense, and perceive, and experience today, and to is, and tomorrow is not. But behind this surface experience, while everything is where everything is transitory, but behind this surface experience, where everything is transitory, happiness and misery, life, death, and birth, there is a changeless reality. To quote the Upanishads, the eternal amongst the non-eternals of life, the pure consciousness amongst everything that is conscious, the highest abiding joy in the midst of the fleeting pleasures of life. Is it wrong to seek pleasures? Of course not. It's just in the long run futile. It's just in the long run not going to satisfy. So the sooner you come to that conclusion, the sooner you sense, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, I have a little pleasure, then that pleasure is gone. Where is something that lasts? The sooner that you come to the conclusion that uh, seeking the pleasures of life is futile, the sooner you will begin to practice that which will yield that which is truly fulfilling and truly expansive with it within you till finally it takes over everything because that is its nature it is like an artesian spring first we see it as a trickle coming out from under a, a, a stack of rocks and we slowly and slowly through our practice lift those heavy rocks off and the trickle becomes greater and greater and finally, we lift off the last rock and boosh, the artesian, the artesian spring bursts forth. This is what Christ meant when he said the water of life. So it is there within each of us. It is only to be uncovered. First, we have to want to, and then we have to encourage that wanting to and practice, be constant in our practice, and then we have to look at the things that are in our lives that are those rocks covering it and say, I'm going to leave this behind. I'm going to release it. I'm not going to suppress it. I'm not going to repress it. That does not work. You simply say, this isn't working for me. I'm going to leave it behind. It's just like you have an old car that no longer is serving you well. You may have been very fond of that car. And you may have gotten much great service out of that car but you're going to get a new car because that car is no longer serving you well. Well, that's exactly it. You get a new car and it has new features and new abilities. And, you, and this is exactly what happens as we make progress in spiritual life. We think, oh, I didn't know this was even possible. I didn't know this joy. I had some intimations of this joy. I'd seen other people driving that kind of car, and uh, but I didn't know it for myself. Mm. It is a self-fulfilling practice. As we work at it, it gets better and better. 
and, and there's no way of telling anyone about that. It's like if you're hungry, watching somebody else eat isn't going to do you a darn bit of good. No, you have to eat for yourself. Then you experience the deliciousness of the food. Well, the same thing is true of spiritual life. Any comments or questions or concerns or anything you'd like to offer from your own experience or wisdom? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear, so I am. Yeah, I just wanted to share this um, incident that I just read in um, Sri Ramakrishna and his Divine Play mm -hmm. um, that is sort of uh, representative of the love for God. Mm -hmm. So Sri Ramakrishna's father one time uh, had not heard from one of his nephews. So he got concerned and he started walking to see the nephew. He walked several miles, I forget how many miles, but like two, three hours. And just when he was about to reach that other village, he saw some fresh bell, uh, bell leaves, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, it's auspicious for Shiva. So he got so overwhelmed that he forgot um, what his original intent was, he picked the leaves and walked all the way back to his home another two, three hours so that he could worship Shiva with those leaves. And then he went again the next day to meet his nephew. So God came so much um, to his forefront that he forgot everything else. Well, <laughs> this, this is what happens when we are, are so focused as as Shruti Ram was, you know, Sri Ramakrishna's father. Beautiful story. Anything else from anyone? The eternal among the non-eternals of life, the pure consciousness amongst everything that is conscious is the highest abiding joy. No. The highest abiding joy in the midst of the fleeting pleasures of life. That is the reality. That is Brahman. That is God. It doesn't matter what you call it. And, and please, Remember again that each of us is unique. It really does not matter what you call it. As it says in Sri Chaitanya's prayer, various are thy names, O Lord. In each and every name, thy power resides. So, that that divinity within ourselves recognizes which is it has no name i mean we have these names brahman god all that business it has no name how can anything that is eternal changeless infinite have a name that, that in itself is a limitation but we have a name and that in that name we recognize and the divine itself recognizes. It's like Sri Ramakrishna says, when a child is just a baby, they try to say father and they say da, 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 da. Does the father not know who's being addressed? Of course the father knows. So it doesn't matter what we call it. It doesn't matter what we think about doesn't matter what you call it. You are free, perfect, divine. You are free, perfect, divine. That is your very nature. And that is what you are seeking to unfold. That divinity within is what you are seeking to unfold. Only you are trying only you are trying to unfold it, as Swami Vivekananda said, in, in little mud puddles, <laughs> rather than in the ocean of consciousness, 
were playing in little mud puddles. Well, we can stop. Or we can continue to splash in the mud puddles. Children love to splash in the mud puddles. It's really and truly up to us. You are seeking to unfold that. Only you are trying to unfold it, as Swami Vivekananda said, in little mud puddles. What is religion? It is to seek consciously what you are seeking unknowingly in the shadows of life to make that pursuit conscious rather than it, it goes on within us always. We are growing, whether we, we are part of universe that is still in its anti-entropic phase, that is still expanding and growing and changing and becoming more. Hmm? If, if the Vedas, and the physicists are correct. And it's interesting how they've come to about the same conclusion about the length of time that this manifestation of universe exists. According to the physicists, we're, the astrophysicists, we're about 14 billion years in. 14 billion years into what? Approximately 100 to 110 billion years. So lots of unfolding <laughs> to go, lots of unfolding to go. And at some point, as they discovered, when they discovered the Higgs boson, you know, which has the perfect value for manifesting the universe and then unmanifesting the universe, dissolving the universe, absolutely a stunning discovery, you know. So if you say, well, the, the anti-entropic, the, the creative and complexifying phase lasts 50 to 55 billion years. We're still just a little bit into that. And then, then the decline begins, the dissolution begins. So lots of time to play. <laughs> so make conscious what you are seeking unknowingly in the shadows of life. Jump out of the mud puddles, first find a lake, a river, a stream, and then find your way to the ocean. To quote the, world, to quote the words of a Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, the, wor the word of God can be heard in the soul, the light of God, can shine in the soul and transform the soul into God. To quote the words of a Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, the, wor the word of God can be heard in the soul. The light of God can shine in the soul and transform the soul into God. Try to meditate upon the truth that we are living in the city of Brahman. We live, move, and have our being in God. So there's just a couple of minutes left. Is there anything else that anyone would like to offer from their own experience or wisdom? or would like to ask as a question or raise as a concern? Anything at all about what's been said? Okay. We'll leave it there for this week then. And we'll end with this. Oh, dearly beloved, divine presence, a flower at your feet for each one who comes to your open door, a flower at your feet 
for each one who stands by your open door and says, come to me, come to me, offering to break this world's chain that binds us down to ignorance, suffering, and death. A flower at your feet for each one who takes the path that you have struck through this, your jungle world. Om Amen. Om Amen. Om Amen. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. <clears throat> and as our final loving salutation, Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Durga, Durga, Durga. May you be safe. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So, for those of you who choose to join us until tomorrow morning, when the topic is devotion and renunciation. Devotion and renunciation. So, um, hope to see you, as many of you as care to come at that time. And uh, until then, any final thought or uh, loving concern from anyone? All right, we'll end it there and we'll pick it up next week on Saturday with uh, something that uh, Swami Vivekananda said. All right, dears, until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.